All right. All right. For us big kids, for us big kids, we are going to be in Deuteronomy. Got to take a little side note. We've been in Ruth. We're going to be in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy is one of the first books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So it's going to be toward the front of your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, you should see a blue one in the pew back in front of you. Uh, we would love for you to open that up and join us in reading God's Word. Um, I feel a little loud. Am I a little loud? I'm going to get even louder. Yeah. Oh, he, he's telling you to mute me. Don't do that. Don't listen to this guy. Yeah, that, sound, that sounds pretty good. A little bit lower maybe. I'm sorry. Pick on the sound guys up there. They do a great job. Um, Perfect. That sounds great. Uh, okay. Uh, use that blue Bible. If you need a blue Bible, take that one home with you. If you know somebody who needs a blue Bible, take that one home and give them to you. We love giving away Bibles here, so please, please consider uh, that our gift to you today. Deuteronomy chapter 6 will be big number 6, little number 4. Um, child dedication. Child dedication Sunday. Uh, at the end of our service, towards the end of our service, we're going to bring up some of our young families, some of our young children, and we're going to dedicate them um, to God today. We're going to join together. We're going to have parents make vows in how they're going to raise their children uh, in the love of God. And we, as their church, are going to be supporting them and taking a vow, saying that we will support and love them and encourage them as well. Uh, so we're glad you're here for this precious time. Uh, so the question then is, as a parent... This is the most important question I could probably ask myself. How in the world, as a sinful man who falls short in so many ways, how in the world do I point my kids to Jesus? How do I do that? Well, good news is, God's Word is sufficient. God's Word is powerful. God knows what we need. He knows what our children need. And so God has given us everything we need in His Word. And today we're going to find what the Jews considered the most important piece of Scripture in all of God's Word. It is something they thought about and talked about all the time. It was so precious to them, as we will find out, they nailed it, this piece of Scripture, to the front of their doorposts. They put it on the front of their gates as you enter their cities. They took this, these verses so seriously that they connected them in a little box on their foreheads and tied them around their hands. Is what they tried to say the moment before they died. And as parents and as church family who are tasked with raising children to love Jesus, here is the message for parents and for churches when it comes to children. It says this, Loving God loudly is the best gift we can give our children. Loving God loudly is the best gift we can give our children. Now listen, some of you are going to be like I was a few years ago, and you'll say, I'm not a parent. I can just fall asleep and not do anything and just kind of chill. I don't need to worry about this. This is one I can take a break from. I can start thinking about the Chiefs game coming up and everything they need to do. Don't think about it. You're going to have all afternoon to think about the Chiefs, okay? Listen, as a parent of beautiful little girls... In your church family, even if you're a grandma, even if you have no children, even if you're a college student, my little girls are in your church family. You are my brother or sister in Christ, so you are their aunt or uncle. And you might not realize it, you are making an impact on their lives. So, from a dad to you, help me, join me, in loving God loudly in front of our children. Let me show you what I mean. Let me show you where this comes from. Deuteronomy chapter 6, big number 6, little number 4. We're going to read through little number 9. It goes like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. 
you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit at your home and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your head. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Okay. The first thing we must understand about this passage that is all important to our faith, all important to the people of Israel, the first thing that we must see, we must understand, the cornerstone of a relationship with God is this. God is lovely. Our God is lovely. And this God is so lovely. All human existence should be dedicated to adoring Him. Our God is so unbelievably lovely. Everything about our lives should be dedicated to loving Him. I think this idea that all of human existence should be dedicated to loving God, I think that brings God appropriate glory. You remember what glory means? Some that's one of those Christianese terms that we kind of get lost in. Glory means pulling away the curtain and revealing God for how valuable He is. How valuable is He? You can't imagine how valuable he is. How lovely is he? We can't imagine how lovely he is. Therefore, it is right, maybe the best thing that we could ever think. It is right for all creation to recognize and to submit to the infinite value of our God. There's nothing better than all of that. All of creation has been designed and created to scream about how valuable God is. Are you with me? Not only that, not only does finding God so lovely and adoring Him with all we are bring Him an appropriate amount of glory, it also brings us our best possible existence. God's infinite glory, God's infinite beauty, His infinite love ability is central to everything that He does and everything that He has created. This is what He tells us in Isaiah 43. He says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So this verse is telling us, crystal clear and is in unison with verses all throughout the Bible, that you, my friend, my brother and sister in Christ, or you, my friend, who is seeking who this Jesus guy is, you and I, we were created to bring God glory. That's why we were created. And so any human existence that rejects this idea that God is absolutely lovable, any human existence that rejects the true God revealed in Christ is supremely valuable. Any existence that says God is not the most beautiful thing in existence, that life will move toward destruction. If everything about the world and the universe centers on the glory of God and seeing Him who, for who He is and glorifying Him and showing Him to be valuable and enjoying Him forever, if that is what life is all about, any life that says, God is okay, but money is where it's at. 
In your life that says, God is okay, but sex, that's what we really need. Any life that says the most beautiful thing, the most valuable thing is family or reputation or food or security or comfort. Any life that replaces the glory of God with any of these things will only find destruction. How do I raise my girls as a follower of Jesus Christ? I must understand that me and every fiber of my being and who I am is all about loving God and adoring Him. We have a lovely God. Can you imagine? Can we imagine the true loveliness of God? Think about this. Think about how beautiful this God must be. My wife and my girls, see how fast her head popped up? My wife and my girls are the most beautiful things in the world to me. Imagine how beautiful the God is who created them. Imagine the beauty of the God who paints sunsets. How beautiful must this God be? Imagine the loveliness of the God who invented brotherhood and friendship and motherhood and fatherhood. Imagine the loveliness of that God. Imagine the power of the God who spun the stars in the sky. Imagine the inventiveness of the God who created Einstein and Newton and Edison. What must that God be like? We have a lovely God. What does Deuteronomy 6 say about the center of our relationship with God? Let's read it together. Verse 5. Verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. What's the center of our relationship with our God? Is it obedience? Does he say you shall obey the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might? No. Should we? Yeah. Is that what it says? No. What's the sin of our relationship with God? Is fear at the center of our relationship with our God? You shall fear the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Is that what it says? Is knowledge, you should know the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might? Is righteousness at the center? You shall be righteous for your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Is that the center of our relationship with our God? Is holiness or purity? No. What's at the center of our relationship with our God? Love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. So I must ask myself, if I'm talking about parenthood, when I talk about two little girls who watch me every single day, and they hear me talk about God, and will hear me preach, for my little girls, what do they see is the center of my relationship with my God? God wants our obedience. 
God desires for us to be righteous. God desires for us to be holy. But at the very core, at the center of our relationship with our God, He calls us to love Him. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? So our question is, do I find God lovely? Is that the central question? Do I find God lovely? Do my girls see their father absolutely adoring his God? Or do they see their, their father fearing their God? Or do they see their father so, so bent out of shape and worried about his obedience that they don't see him adoring his God? Do they see a church family so focused and concerned about the righteousness of other people or the sin of other people? Do they walk into this place and hear conversations and gossip about this woman living this way and about this guy doing this? Do they hear that? And do they get the message that Trinity Baptist Church at the center of our relationship with our God is not love, it is holiness? Or do they see a church family that adores their God? Bailey just started coming and she got out of nursery and she's sitting in here for the worship. Does she... Hear mom and dad adoring their Savior through song. Does she hear her church family adoring their God? So if this is the center of my relationship with my God, and I'm concerned about raising my daughters in the way of Jesus Christ, what do I do? Read verse 7 with me again. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them while you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Here's the picture. Here's the picture. The Hebrew word there is more like impress upon them. And the picture, the picture that God wants us to get is me picking up my little girl Charlie and holding her there and seeing that her little heart was like daddy's heart before he met Christ. That her little heart is a heart of stone before she meets Jesus. And the image is daddy Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength so that she sees it. And when you do that, you wake up talking about how lovely God is. You go to sleep talking about how lovely God is. You walk to work talking about how lovely God is. She sees her church family talking about how lovely God is. And in that way, it's like you take, you take um, an etch, you, you etch, you take a chisel and you're etching into her little heart, her little pre-Christ heart. You're etching into her heart the love of God. You impress that upon her. And your chisel is in your hand every single day. And you never put it down. It's like she has a heart of granite. The people who are unsaved, unsaved hearts and souls are, are like granite. And he compels us and he tells us, love God in front of them. And it's like you're etching into her heart how lovely God is. That takes time. That takes effort. That takes sweat. And that takes wisdom. And that is a serious thing. Impress upon them the loveliness of God. So how do we etch the loveliness of God into our children? Parents, how do we etch the loveliness of God into the hearts of our children. Number one, find God so lovely that you can't stop talking about Him. It says, talk about Him when you sit. Leisure time. 
And talk about him when you're walking, when you're going to work. Talk about how beautiful he is in the morning and at night and everything in between. It says, post it to your doorpost. That means everything that happens within your house. Talk and, and obsess over the loveliness of your God within your house. And listen, it's not popular. Attach it to your gate means when you're in public, talk about how lovely God is. The loveliness and beauty of our God cannot be held just in our homes. It's too lovely for that. It will explode into our community. Find God so lovely that I can't stop talking about Him. So here's the question that comes to my mind then. What do I always talk about? What do I always talk about? Parents, what do you always talk about? Those little ears don't pick up on everything we say, do they? Am I talking about things that that reveal a bitter heart? Do I talk about things that reveal an angry heart? A disappointed heart? Do my girls hear me only talking about things that don't matter? It's amazing how they pick stuff up. Listen, I've got two tiny rabid Chiefs fans at home. Charlie can't even pronounce Chiefs. But every time it comes on, she's jumping up and down, cheering, screaming. Why does she do that? Well, because she's wise beyond her years. <laughs> but also because she hears dad and mom talking about the Chiefs. So obviously the question then is, does she hear me get as excited about my God, as she hears me get excited about the Chiefs. Can I get excited about the Chiefs? Is that a sinful thing? No. Broncos fans, I don't want to hear from you right now. Is it sinful? No, it's not sinful. Will we get angry around our kids? Yes, we'll get angry around our kids. Are we still sinners? Yes, we're still sinners. We're going to have all these things. But the question is, what is constantly on my mind will come out of my mouth? And do my girls hear a dad who is in love with his God. How do we etch the loveliness of God into our children's hearts? Believe that God is so lovely, He deserves our top devotion. It starts out by saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The meaning behind that gets back into sonship and fatherhood and parents and all that because it's, 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 it's echoing Jewish thought about sons. It's saying, hear sons, hear O son, hear O Israel. That's what you say. Hear O sons, the Lord is one. Our God is one. The idea is one God, our God, none but Him. What idols have we erected in our homes that seek to split our devotion to God? Hear, O Israel, etch into the hearts of your children that God is above everything else. How do we do this? It's not rocket science. We all know it. If you've been in church any at all in your life, you know it. Spend time with our God. Spend time with the things of God and spend time with the people of God. The things that capture our hearts that we feel lovely, that we feel are lovely and worthy of devotion, we will give our time, right? Right? I need to quit talking about it. Anybody going to watch the Chiefs game tonight? You know that feeling that you're getting? I'm getting it right now, just thinking about it, right? This worst, sick feeling. You're going to endure that for this team. Who knows what's going to happen, and you're going to do it. You're going to put that time in. Why? Because you find them 
lovely? Where do you spend your time? God is supreme. He is one. He is our God. There is none other than Him. We preach this to our kids. We etch this into our hearts when we are willing to sacrifice precious things for God because He is the most precious thing. How do we etch the loveliness of God and His commands into the hearts of our children? Love Him yourself. How do we etch the loveliness of God into our children? Love Him ourselves. You want to know what keeps me up at night? The thing that worries me the most in my entire life. Um, preacher's kids are notorious for going crazy. Anybody ever know that? I am one. Amen. My dad, the preacher, says amen. Preacher's kids are notorious for going crazy. And they've studied preacher's kids. And they've studied this dynamic in, in homes of pastors. And they've, they asked, what happens here? Why, why does this happen? Um, and the study found that if preacher's kids reject the faith, preacher's kids run from church, preacher's kids run from God, when they hear dad talking about God one way from the pulpit, and they see him live the opposite way at home. They hear Dad talk about how lovely God is from the pulpit and then they see how Dad lives at home and that does not match. They see that Dad claims to love God but Dad lives like God has no consequence on his life. How do you etch the loveliness of God into our children's hearts. Know Him. Love Him. Devote time to Him. Study Him. Talk to Him. Read and hear from Him. Make church a priority. Listen, again, it's not rocket science. I have conversations like this all the time with people where they say, I'm struggling in my faith. And I ask them, listen, we know what God wants from us. Are you talking to Him in prayer? Are you hearing from Him in the Word? And are you going to church? No, pastor. It's, there's got to be more to it than that. It's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. Do you want to grow in the love for God? Talk to Him. Do you want to grow in the love for God? Listen to Him. Do you want to grow in the love for God? Come be around your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not rocket science. But we want to make it rocket science. How do we etch the loveliness of God into our children? Talk about Him. Love Him yourself. Give Him priority. So what do we talk about? What do we talk about when we talk about God with our kids? Well, the Jews took these passages and they took them literally. And so they actually literally, like we said, put a box on their heads called a phylactery. Put a box on there, they'd wrap it around, and wrap it around their body, and they'd wrap it around their arm, because that's what it says, okay? And inside this box, we know what they put inside this box. Inside this box, there are four chambers. And they put, put, put four pieces of Scripture in this box. And all four of these pieces of Scripture deal with how lovely God has been. And all four of these pieces of Scripture say, teach this to your children. Isn't that fabulous? Do you want to know what to talk about with your kids? When you wake up, when you go to sleep, when you're sitting watching the Chiefs, and when you're driving to work, you want to know what to talk about? Here's a good place to start. The first piece of Scripture they put in there was exactly what we read. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. How you, and he says, tell your son that God is lovely. Do you tell your kids that God is lovely? And listen, dads, guys, we have a trouble with this because we're macho men, aren't we? We're tough, right? Honey, am I tough? No, I'm not tough. But we get this macho. I can't talk about lovely things. I can't talk about flowers. If your God 
is so lovely that He can create the most beautiful flowers on the planet. You, my friend, are not too macho to talk about it and notice. Tell your son God is lovely. Tell your daughter God is lovely. Look at those beautiful flowers God made. Listen to that beautiful music. All of these things have their, their, at their core, their nature comes from who God is. Funny jokes comes from a hilarious God. Stars in the sky come from a beautiful, powerful creator. Our God is lovely. He cares for the sparrow. Can you believe that? The, the huge God creator of the universe cares for this tiny little nothing bird. That is lovely. Talk to your kids about how lovely God is. Talk to your kids about how God is lovely. He always does what's right. He is quick to forgive. Talk about how beautiful he is, that he is sacrificial, that he is patient. My friends, your sons and daughters have a fertile imagination. How can you stoke that imagination about the beauty of God? second piece of scripture they put in to the phylactery was Exodus 13, 1 through 10. And it basically says this, tell your sons, God has delivered you from your enemies. What do you talk about when you get up, when you go? Tell them how God has delivered you from your enemies. Let's talk about Israel from Egypt. But has God delivered you from your enemies? I'm glad all the kids are out because I was going to use this illustration. Are monsters real? No, not the little ones they talk about, right? Monsters aren't real. But there are way worse things that are real. True monsters are way scarier than anything they could see on TV or read in a book. There are true monsters that are after our children. and They are sin and death and hell. When you wake up and when you go to sleep, when you walk down the road and when you watch the chiefs, tell your son and your daughter that Jesus Christ has slayed the real monsters. The next passage they put, talk to your sons, Exodus 13, 11 through 16, tell your son that God has delivered you from slavery. He delivered Israel from literal chains. My friends, Romans 6.20 says, We were slaves to sin. Has God freed you from slavery? Tell your kids. Listen, this is hard for some of us. Tell your kids you're a sinner. Don't, 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 don't ever run from the fact that we are sinners. Tell your kids that God has broken us free from the consequences of sin. Wisely confess and repent in front of our kids. When we never confess our sins to our children, we are etching lies into their hearts. Either I'm teaching them that I'm perfect and I don't need Jesus, or I'm teaching them when they see that I've obviously sinned and I don't repent, I'm teaching them that sin is not that important and is not a real monster. Moms and dads, aunts and uncles, church family, why does God, why is one of the reasons God lets us still be sinners? Why hasn't He just made me perfect? Because my job with my little girls is to sit them down often. Say, Bailey, Daddy messed up. He sinned. Will you forgive me? And, but do you know what I can say? I can say, this daddy is a sinner, but you have a perfect heavenly father. Isn't that phenomenal? Isn't that phenomenal, dads, that, that, that we are the biggest sinners in our household and we should be the biggest repenters in our household and when we repent, we can point them to Jesus and Jesus can resurrect our sinfulness for the good of our children? Isn't that fabulous? 
Is it just me? Are you with me? Don't run from the fact that we're sinners. Jesus can resurrect that for our, our kids' good. And the last one. What do we tell our children? Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21 went in the box and it says this. Teach your children those who love God He has promised a land. Teach your children that God has a new heaven and a new earth planned for those who love Him. Teach your children that God has promised someday there won't be any more shots. Way to give our kids shots. Worst thing in the world, right? There won't be any more shots in heaven. I told Bailey this the other day. There won't be any more bedtimes in heaven. There won't be any more tears in heaven. Those things seem so small and petty, but to a four-year-old, they mean everything. Now, there's some of us here today who hear this and have kids that they're worried about. What I want to do is I want to leave us with this. Remember, remember, parents. I have these conversations all the time. Parents, remember. God loves your children too much to leave their salvation up to you. Are you with me? Parents, I would love to take this burden off of you. God loves your children too much to leave their souls in your hands. God is in total control. Is that right? Yes or no? God always does what's right. Yes or no? God is trustworthy. Yes or no? God loves to save. Yes or no? God is merciful. Yes or no, as long as we still live, there is hope for us. Finally, parents, some of us will look at this and say, this is too much for me. I probably just want to say join the club. But here's the good news. How can we work toward etching the loveliness of God into our children. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is now at work in you. So this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. We're going to enter a time of invitation. During this time, uh, parents and children's church kids are going to come down. Parents, we're going to have you go get your, your kids if they're in nursery or somewhere. Um, and so why don't you go ahead and do that. Parents are going to head that way. Um, and so the rest of us, we're going to enter a time of decision. Church family, do we take these things seriously? Do you know that Bailey is watching you and listening to you? Do you know that Charlie is watching you and listening to you? Do you know the challenge from God for this church is to raise up and disciple the young children that He has given to us? Maybe you're here today and you're a parent like me and you're struggling with this. You realize you fall short. During this time as we sing together, maybe this is when you deal with God and ask Him to help you make His loveliness the top priority in your house. Maybe you're here today and you haven't found God lovely and you realize that there's a group of people here who have been saved by Jesus and by the lovely God that we serve. Maybe He's calling you today to serve Him too. During this song, I'm going to be praying for you. Would you stand? Would you sing with us, please? The nails in your hands, the nails in your feet, they tell me how much you love me The thorns in your brow 
they tell me how you pour so much shame to love me and when the heavens pass away all your scars will still remain and forever they will say how much you love me Forever my love Forever my heart Forever my life It's yours Forever my love Forever my heart my life is yours, it's yours. Thank you, worship team. Uh, you can be seated. You can be seated. Uh, now, I'm going to ask the, uh, the families of the kiddos that we're going to dedicate to please come up front with us. Uh, we got to make a lot of room. Uh, I didn't realize how many young families and young kids we have at Trinity. Uh, this started out with uh, two kids and has ballooned to, if all of them were able to show up today, we're going to have 10 children we're going to dedicate today. How cool is that? How cool is that? Uh, so families, we're just going to go ahead and, and have you stand up here on the stage so we can see how beautiful you are and your kids are. There you go, Charlie. Oh, this is the best Sunday of the year. All right. All right, thank you. Come on down, gang. Hi, Jack. Okay. Oh, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, okay, so what, uh, what is this all about? So this isn't um, this isn't trying to get these children saved. This is not a sign of their salvation. This is nothing like that. This is these parents, these families. Wow, how awesome is that? Right? That's fabulous. These families are dedicated to loving and training and discipling their children. They're coming before their church family and vowing that they will do all that they can to show Jesus as Lord. And what we're going to do as their church family is that we're going to vow to support them. Um, and so what we've done at first, we've asked for, man, seriously, that is the best picture in the world. Uh, Elizabeth's going to help me here. Um, we're going to introduce a few of them. Um, I, so, Miss Elizabeth, you want to grab this? Um, Lucy. This is Lucy. Lucy's favorite thing is reading books with mom. And so we asked for their favorite things, and we asked for a verse to be read over them. Lucy's verse is Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Isn't that fabulous? Why don't we do this? They've got their hands full. I didn't think this one through. We're going to put these down here, but this is what we've got them as their church. At the bottom it says, January 20, 2019, Trinity Baptist Church, your church family loves you. And so we have these uh, for all the kiddos. Um, Oh, I don't know this person at all. Charlotte Grace Hodges. Charlie. Charlie is 22 months. <laughs> Preacher's kids, I told you. Charlie's favorite thing, get this. Charlie's favorite thing is to sing and dance with Daddy. Isn't that right? Yeah. Charlie's verse is, thank you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Thank you, Miss Elizabeth. Okay. Now we've got three in a row. The Himes. Abishai, Hadassah, and Tirza. Abby likes to do science. Hadassah loves to read books. And Tirza loves to smile and talk to her mama. And those three, those three kids, their verse is 3 John 1, 4. 
I have no greater joy than to hear my children are walking in the truth. Fabulous. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now we have Sophie Moots. Sophie, there she is. Gerber baby. <laughs> Sophie Moots. Her favorite thing to do is to play with her sister. All matching outfits and everything. Hi, Emma. Um, Psalm 139, 13 through 14. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Fabulous. Oh, thank you. And now we've got three more. We've got the Tholins. Morgan and Bailey and Jack. Hi, guys. Their verse is Proverbs 22.6. Start children off in the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Morgan's favorite thing to do is color, arts and crafts, and spending time with family. Bailey's favorite thing to do is to play outside. And Jack and I are kindred spirits. He and I like to sleep and eat. <laughs> okay. And last but not least, Mr. Walker. And Isaiah's little brother. You like to play with snakes. Of course you do. This is Walker. Walker likes to throw balls. And his verse, yeah, at his sister and brother. We might have a little preacher right there. I don't know. Psalm 28, 4 through 7. Those who forsake instruction praise the wicked, but those who heed it resist them. Evildoers do not understand what is right, but those who seek the Lord understand it fully. Better the poor whose walk is blameless than to be rich whose ways are perverse. A discerning son heeds instruction, but a companion of gluttons disgraces his father. Psalm 28, 4 through 7. And so what we're going to do, we've asked my dad, Pastor Terry Hodges, to come up and give the vows so that I can be daddy right now. So daddy, you want to come on up? I've learned everything, everything I know I've learned from him. So if you don't like it, it's his fault. If you do like it, I learned it despite him. Um, and so what we're going to do, gang, we're all going to go together. He's going to read four or five short vows. And at the end of them, he will say, if you agree, at the end of each one, at the end of each one we're going to say, if yes, say we will. And we'll all say we will together. And then we'll turn and we'll do us as a church family. So you never turn over a microphone to another preacher. Oh, here we go. What a special day. Thank you. I'm honored to be able to share it with you today. This is a commitment of families, of parents. So parents, if you will listen carefully. As parents, will you dedicate yourself wholeheartedly to your relationship with Christ knowing that the life you model will shape your children even more deeply than the words that you say. If yes, say we will. And parents, will you dedicate yourself to faithfully pursue a Christ-like relationship with your spouse by sacrificially loving each other, prioritizing each other, and knowing that one of the best gifts that you can give your children is a joyful and godly marriage. If yes, say we will. And parents, will you dedicate yourself to actively participate in the church community for the sake of Jesus' kingdom, knowing that your children need input and examples from the church family in addition to your family? If yes, say we will. And parents, will you take every opportunity that life gives you to diligently teach your children to love the Lord Jesus and to observe all that he commanded, knowing that your primary responsibility as parents is to train your child to be Jesus' disciples. If yes, say we will. And parents, when you fall short of these vows, will you model repentance to your children? Will you lean on the forgiveness of Christ? And will you point them to their perfect heavenly parent? If yes, say we will. The responsibility for raising children is not 
exclusive to the parents. But as a church family, Trinity, you share in that responsibility. And so this is a covenant that you need to make with these parents. So to the church, Trinity Baptist Church, understanding that you are a family, a church family, and understanding that we are all responsible for the spiritual encouragement of our brothers and sisters in our church, will you joyfully dedicate yourself to pray for, to encourage, to teach, to love, and to support these families, no matter how difficult it may be? If yes, will you, Trinity Baptist Church, say, we will? Let's bow together for a prayer of dedication. Father, thank you for children, especially for the children in this church. Children represent life. Help us to realize as a church family that sometimes ministry is messy, that the true sign of spirituality in a church are handprints on the wall and crayon marks in the nursery. We thank you, Father, for children and for parents that are willing to commit their lives to follow Jesus. We thank you most of all that these children have an opportunity in a very natural way to come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior because of the witness of these parents and because of the witness of this church family. Bless Trinity Baptist Church. Bless these children, Father. Bless these parents in their commitment to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Jordan. All right. Thank you, Miss Elizabeth. Uh, parents, you can go ahead and take a seat, um, and we will pass these out. Let's do that at the very end. Thank you, Miss Elizabeth. Um, and I'm going to ask the, the uh, we're going to finish worshiping God together uh, through the giving of tithes and offerings. So if the ushers will please come forward. It's like a horde. I don't know what to do. They're coming at me. There we go. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. <laughs> you know what a sad church is where things like that don't ever happen, right? God put the wiggle in kids, and we love that.